looks like we're struggling to fit any more people in the room, um, which is uh, quite a good way to start. So um, we should kick off to maximize the time we have with these incredibly good um, speakers. Uh, hello, I'm Robert Colville, the director of the Center for Policy Studies, and welcome to our very first event of the Fringe. Um, we're discussing the present and future of conservatism and the Conservative Party with uh, four people who are incredibly well qualified to, to discuss that. Um, from right to left, we have Lord Spencer, uh, who is the chairman of the CPS and therefore my boss and therefore the most charismatic, yeah. intelligent, <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> handsome man uh, in the... In, in, in the uh, he's a greaser. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and also, uh, more to the point, is one of the few people to have um, started and grown a FTSE 100 company uh, from scratch in the UK. Um, Sir Graham Brady is obviously the chairman of the 1922 committee, as well as being deputy chairman of the, of the CPS. Kate Andrews is a veteran economic uh, commentator now of the Spectator, and Dr. Frank Luntz is a uh, well, is a superstar um, pollster and political uh, expert um, who has been in the UK with the CPS as a visiting academic fellow this summer and um, we'll be jetting off back to the States uh, shortly after conference, but will be providing us with one last dose of insight um, while he's here. So, um, yeah, um, if you, we'll be trying to ask uh, as many questions as possible from the audience, uh, so please have your thinking caps on and microphones will be coming around. Um, but I'd just like to ask each of the speakers uh, to sort of say a few words very quickly, like what, what does conservatism mean in 2021? Like, where are we? How conservative is, is this government? What's, uh, what's going on, really? Um, and let's start, um, well, with Michael. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, for that very generous and flattering introduction, which I'm extremely grateful, um, of course. Um, this is my, my, my first um, conference as uh, chairman of the CPS, and I'm very proud, privileged to be here. I have been to conferences before. I started in, when I was quite young, actually, in 1977 in Thatcher's uh, first leadership uh, conference as party leader. Um, and indeed, um, which sort of brings me to one of the reasons I'm here. The, the UK, of course, has been through an extraordinary period, and you, as have many countries. We've been through COVID, which has been a, a world-changing event. We have obviously gone through Brexit as well, which is a very significant event for us. We've got some ma very major cultural changes taking place, not just in the UK, but globally. And indeed, a lot of dramatic shifts in global geopolitics. And so a definition of what, what our new government with a substantial majority is all about, where it wants to go, and building our identity is one of the reasons I took on the job of um, chairmanship of the um, CPS after um, Maurice Saatchi retired, after doing the job very, very successfully for a very long time. And um, I think a lot of us feel today that we have a government that isn't perhaps as conservative as the ones that... Um, we uh, talk about, particularly from a CPS point of view, the Thatcher administration. Thatcher, after all, was responsible really for the, um, the formation of the CPS and uh, built an ideology um, which changed the United Kingdom very fundamentally in that period from 1979 to the 80s and 90s. Uh, we have a government which has uh, spent a lot of money, you might argue very reasonably, for justifiable reasons, uh, increased taxation considerably, some would say justifiable because we don't want to change and uh, um, get ourselves excessively in debt. But there is an important debate, I think, that we need to go through to establish what new conservatism looks like today. Um, I'm not going to share all my thoughts now, but I, because I, I want to see, I guess, to an extent, what you, the audience say. But one of the things that C CPS did recently, which has helped us enormously, is to persuade Frank Luntz to come over here from, from the US. He is a, a very distinguished pollster and analyst of some of the social and political changes that are taking place in the country. So I'm sure you will find that very interesting to listen to. And indeed, Graham, of course, is um, a parliamentary of a parliamentarian of very, very many years' experience, um, not just as a parliamentarian, but obviously as chairman of the 22 committee. So I'm going to hand over back to our chairman. Fair enough. Well, that's probably quite a good cue to, um, to ask Frank. Um, so as, as people may, may know, Frank did a big piece of polling for us uh, over the summer on um, political and economic attitudes in Britain, and in fact has been... Um, has been, I think, repeating some of that work in, in, in the US um, since he left us to see um, what conservatism means uh, over, over there as well. So, I mean, Frank, um, we, what does conservatism mean today? And yeah, to the door, yeah. So I'm not gonna, I'm, I, I don't feel it's my role to comment as a foreigner here about your policies, but it is my role to comment on language. And there's also something I always do here. Does anyone have an empty seat next to them? Raise your hands. 
The guys in the back, come on. Let's take half a dozen of you, walk forward, raise your hands if you got an empty seat. Don't be passive. You control the government. <laughs> <laughs> Keep coming up. We got room for about uh, five of you, and we've got standing room on the side here and back there, so there's no reason to wait. <clears throat> Uh, you guys in the back, are you always going to be part of the 1922 committee? Are you going to take charge? And <laughs> Okay, keep your hands up if there's an empty seat. And if there's not, we got standing room right up here on the side, so you don't have to be so far back. Next is, I do feel I have the right to comment on language. And I would begin this by saying, as an example, we've been trying to define the word chaos. It's got a different meaning in America and Great Britain. What I've learned is the definition of chaos in this country is Father's Day at 10 Downing Street. <laughs> I thought that would get a better answer, but uh, <laughs> I have one more for you. You guys have not earned it, so I will save it for another panel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give you five examples of language that you need to consider because in the end, your success is not just what you do, which is more important, it's not just what you achieve, which is essential. It's how you communicate it so that every citizen in this country realizes that this is a better place to be. They need to see the impact, and you've raised the stakes significantly. The idea of leveling up and build back better is saying to the public that they will be able to see a difference when the election comes around. So I'm gonna give you five examples. This administration talks about crime, fighting crime. You produced an anti-crime proposal. Here's the problem. If you're speaking about crime and you're the government, that by definition is a failure. If you talk about crime as the government, it means that you've been unable to prevent it. The government should be talking about public safety. The opponents talk about crime and public safety is preferred to crime. If I asked you a question, what does crime mean to you? When, you? when you see it, you'll say knife crime, or you'll see violence, you'll see police. Public safety is the ability to walk around the neighborhood safe and secure at night with your family. The conservative party should be about public safety, not about crime. Another example, and I see it in the signs around here, you all talk about leveling up. Here's the problem. Some of you believe that leveling up means you get less so other people get more. When you talk about either bringing it back or build back better, that's for everyone. Leveling up is for some people. Build back better is for everyone. Third, capitalism. To too many people, capitalism means a bank. It means the CEO. It means the successful. Instead of capitalism, it's about economic freedom because that's everyone. That's the employee, not just the employer. Economic freedom is about the small business, the high street business, not just about what happens in the city of London. Fourth. Instead of economic growth, which sounds like you went to Oxford or Cambridge, what the public really wants is a healthy economy, healthy schools, healthy neighborhoods, healthy families. For those of you taking notes, and a few of you are, the word healthy is so powerful because it's what the public really wants. And fifth, and I hear this all the time, your conservative party is more concerned about the environment than any conservative party on the face of the globe, and that's impressive to me. But they still talk about sustainability. And that's the status quo. You want to be about cleaner, safer, healthier. You want to be about improvement, not the status quo. Robert, I think that the conservative movement in America is sick, and it's one of the reasons why I'm grateful, grateful to be here and so proud to be associated with CPS. Although I keep telling them, don't use an acronym. Talk about the Center for Policy Studies. An acronym means you're a bureaucrat. Center for Policy Studies means you're smart, and these guys are smart. This is about unity, it's about the future, and unfortunately, conservatism in America is about division and anger and resentment. Please, don't follow the American example, follow the conservative example here in the UK. Thanks, Frank. Um, Graham. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, you can tell that Frank uh, is a pollster, not an old PR man, because I was thinking the fact there were still some empty seats down here meant there were more people standing at the back, which was an even better story for <laughs> us to say that people were uh, crowded into the room. Um, and, and Robert uh, similarly missed the trick by pointing out that Michael is the most charismatic and brilliant person uh, as our chairman, uh, without saying that as deputy chairman, I must be the second most <laughs> um, But I, 
I, I just have um, two, two thoughts for you. One, when I was asked to join this panel, the first thing that came uh, to my mind uh, was the uh, late, great Eric Forth, who was a, a good friend of mine, uh, one of the most cussed individuals ever to uh, occupy a seat in the House of Commons. And the day after David Cameron became leader of the Conservative Party, we had a meeting of the Parliamentary Party, and David said a few words. And then he said, now, has anybody got a question? And I don't think he was expecting any questions. And one hand went up, and it was Eric Fort. He said, yes, Eric, what is it? He said, David, um, I believe in lower taxes, less Europe, and more grammar schools. Am I still a conservative? Which, um, uh, of course, David went on to reassure him that he was. Uh, I would add, and we're, we're currently we're doing very well on one of those, um, less Europe, uh, less well on low taxes, and there's a lot of work to do on more grammar schools. But I would add, crucially, uh, another uh, metric, which is uh, more liberty, freedom. And if the Conservative Party doesn't stand for trusting people to make their own decisions and giving them responsibility for their own lives, then it stands for nothing, uh, in my view. Um, and the other thing, I did, final uh, thought uh, to add, I was talking to a, a young man at the back when I came into the room, and, and we explored one or two of these thoughts, and he said, well, and I said, here we are at the great think tank, the Centre for Policy Studies, founded by Margaret Thatcher and Keith Joseph. And if you're looking for answers as to what the Conservative Party should be, that's a pretty good place to start. And he said to me, but can we still win in the North? if that's the case. And the simple answer is that we did very well in the North when Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister. People forget, uh, and looking in my own area in Greater Manchester, uh, the fact that we held two of the Bolton seats then, as we do now. We held both the Berry seats then, as we do now. We held Hazel Grove then, as we do now. Uh, one of the Warrington constituencies. It is a myth, uh, and quite a big mistake, to imagine that it is not possible uh, to win in the North on the basis of uh, respect for enterprise, cutting everybody's taxes, uh, ensuring that you are offering real opportunity uh, for people across the country, regardless of where they start in life. Thank you, Graham. Um, well said. Um, Kate. Thanks, Rob. Um, I was struck by the Prime Minister's comments this morning on the Andrew Marr show, not when he refused to rule out more tax hikes, because Frankly, after that hike to national insurance, I'm essentially prepared for anything now. It was a, more a phrase that he used. He said that he is a zealous opponent of unnecessary tax hikes. I thought that was a very curious phrase because it raises the question, what is a necessary tax hike, especially in 2021? Now, I can think of a few reasons why it might be necessary to raise taxes, especially after COVID-19 and recovery from a global pandemic. Um, a lot of damage has been done and we're only beginning to discover uh, what that is. Just how many children, it's estimated tens of thousands have fallen out of school completely, 5.6 million people on the NHS waiting list, the health secretary thinks it could go up to 13 million. It's very possible that more money is going to be part of that answer. And if we wanna get technical about it, and interest rates rise, uh, inflation spiraling out of control, things that virtually all economists were laughing at at the start of the year, and now we're taking very, very seriously, could require some change in the tax code. But none of those things are of particular interest to the PM, and, and maybe that's slightly unfair. Um, I, I do think he, he cares a lot about um, the optics, at least, and, and certainly the personal implications of long waiting lists and, and what's happening to children's futures, but we know that he's not a fiscal conservative. He isn't so worried about the interest rates and the inflation. Um, and I wonder when he said that, what he thought that language was opening himself up to, because Jeremy Corbyn would call a lot of tax hikes necessary. Keir Stalmer would call a lot of tax hikes necessar necessary. Uh, indeed, if you have higher taxes, it very often does act as a plaster. It's not the fix to much, but it can make the situation slightly better in the short term, and that's a lot of what the Labour Party is selling. You know, that initial boost of cash will make things slightly better. So you can always use tax as a plaster. And it strikes me that the PM's language is indicating that the Tory party is much more willing to do this now than it was before. Um, so for me, the, the questions about today's panel, about going for growth and what does conservatism mean, three major takeaways 
the first is that we're in very dangerous, ter dangerous territory where tax hikes are becoming justifiable because a Tory government is doing it. Um, if this were a Labour government, I think the Tory MPs who are going along with it now would be shouting to the rooftops about the tax burden being at nearly a 70-year high. Uh, but because it's a Conservative government, it must be necessary, it must be fine. There couldn't possibly be more efficiencies or any spending cuts that we could be considering instead. And that's really bad news for the future of Conservatism. Um, I've heard from a lot of MPs, second, and government advisors that if you look at the makeup of the Cabinet, you should be expecting tax cuts down the line. There are too many free marketeers, too many low-tax Conservatives in there for us not to have some kind of tax cut. Well, that suggests to me that the nature of tax and cutting it is just fundamentally political now, that they're going to think about cutting taxes leading up to the next election, as opposed to believing in them because they know that it's a pro-growth policy and they know that you can actually raise more revenue by cutting certain taxes. And the third thing I would say to, to the future and, and what conservatism means, well, so far, Boris Johnson is defining that by recycling decade-old ideas like the Dill Not proposals to address social care and by borrowing ideas from the left. You know, he, this is a government that endorsed the energy price caps that were brought in by Theresa May that were advocated by Ed Miliband in 2013. And he's now going into a party conference where we have an energy crisis, and a large part of that, and we all know it in this room, is because governments, as hard as they might try, do not get to change the laws of basic supply and demand. Um, if a conservative government, especially one with such a big majority, can't say these things out loud and can't make the case for changing policy now, it's very unclear to me when it would ever be able to do so. Um, bit of a gloomy point to end on there, Rob, but I'll hand it back over to you. Okay, well, um, yes, never difficult to tell the difference between a CPS panel and a ray of sunshine um, at this <laughs> <laughs> thus far. Um, so, so, so a, a couple of things to, so, to te tease out there. We seem to, so everyone seems to be zeroing on, on tax. So is, so that, that's a question, is tax a, is being low tax a sort of axiomatically equivalent to being a conservative? Because we, we have a conservative government which doesn't appear to, to think that. There's also, the, I think Graham raised the geogra geographical point, which is, you know, if you want to win, if you want to win the whole country, does that necessitate some comp compromise on some principle? Uh, but also, then the, the, the point Kate made about about business and, and growth. So, it, it strikes me that the the government has sort of got a very got very good at the sort of spending money bit and less good at the working out how you raise money bit. That um, you know, it's the, the, the sort of growth and productivity and pro-business stuff. I mean, it, it's there in the mix. It's there in the rhetorical mix. But it's not as fleshed out as the, as the, um, the, you know, as, as, as the, the second half of it, w once, you've, once you've got the money. Um, so, w w you, w I mean, whichever of our panelists want, want to sort of go first on, on, any, on, on, on any of those. But it, you know, it can, it, can, you, can you deliver, is, is there such a thing as a sort of pro-business, low-tax national conservatism? Um, or are we... Are we sort of where we are because because Boris wants to win elections? I, I mean, I sp speaking from the businessman's perspective, if I may, um, I think that there is a there is a legitimate argument in the short run for, for the current administration to raise taxes to rebalance our deficit and show that there is a degree of fiscal conservatism. But in the longer run, we have to get back to an agenda, in my view, for, um, in this administration of reducing taxation in the longer run because frankly the tax burden at the moment uh, and the evidence is overwhelming the tax burden at the moment is high enough that it will without doubt affect economic growth and inward investment in the long run um, and um, I, 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 I don't believe there is a reasonable vision of a pro-growth high tax economy that works in the long run um, in fact lots of people say well look at Scandinavia well actually tax rates in the UK now are similar uh, in many instances, if not higher than Scandinavian tax. The top rate of income tax, top marginal rate of income tax is in about 63% at the moment. So I, I think we really need to put pressure on um, uh, the government, the party in general, to really uh, fine tune its thinking of how we return to a trajectory of lowering taxation. And also, by the way, as uh, aligned to that is, um, bluntly a more efficient spending of, 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 tax, of taxpayers' money. This often gets forgotten. Um, um, 
all of us in our own lives make an effort to spend our money efficiently. Very few of us believe that governments spend their money efficiently. And this, th this issue seems to be left behind very often. And many of us, no doubt, are worried that the increase in, in expenditure into the National Health Service will not increase proportionately the output from the National Health Service. And that's a profoundly inefficient way of spending money. I'm not saying I necessarily I have the solutions, I wish I did, but um, throwing more money at things and not getting a proportionate increase in output is a, uh, a, a way to long-term ruin. Um, Frank, can I come to you here? Because in the, in the work you did for the CPS, going, going back to the, kind of the point about what is conservatism, one of the more surprising and depressing results if you run a think tank which is kind of dedicated to publishing stuff about economics is that what welds together the modern conservative coalition is not economics. It, so there's, there's two parts of this. That it's not just that you know, economic messages did quite badly. Like w when you put up message, you, know, you said, who do you admire most in the country and, and the world? You know, the nurse came top and the entrepreneur came bottom. That, you know, that people like, words like aspiration and growth didn't really do something. It was, it was, it was all of the social, it was the social things which got people. It was the kind of cultural things that really sort of seemed to strike, strike the nerve. Yeah, I'm, I'm listening to all this, I'm watching all this, and Lord Spencer, this, I think this is the big difference between conservatism in America and conservatism over here which is in America, we would be figuring out how to destroy the left. And this is where Joe Biden is in the greatest amount of trouble. I'll try one more. Joe Biden is so old, it takes him an hour and a half to watch 60 Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Biden is so old, his favorite painting is The Last Supper. If you look carefully, it's the second waiter from the left. <laughs> one more. Joe Biden is so old, the only time he doesn't have to pee is when he's peeing. <laughs> this guy here is writing all of these down. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is, yeah, only half of them are mine. This is the best one of all. I'm actually, you have to come to other one of these CPS panels because the best one, the one that you're going to tell everybody, I will give at one of the CPS panels I'm doing. I'm just not going to tell you which one it is. <laughs> uh, this issue of waste. I, if I'm labor, if I'm a labor strategist, I'm trying to figure out every promise. I'm writing them all down, and I'm going to ask a very simple question. Did the conservatives keep their promise? Did they level up? Did they build back better? Where is the hospital? Where is the road? Where are all these? It's only coming. Your election's coming, what, two years from now, probably? Are you going to actually be able to start building these things? Are people going to benefit from them? You've made so many promises. And, and I understand why, but you're making promises that I don't know if you can keep. And Rob is right. What's unifying conservatism now is tradition and legacy and culture and social policy. And I usually use this as my final comment, but I don't know if I'll get one. I'm scared to death of woke, but not just of woke coming to the UK, the way that it's come to America, because it is destroying our universities, it's destroying our media, it's destroying entertainment, it's destroying all the things that have an impact on how we think. But I'm also afraid of how you all use it, because you can win an election with it. I promise you, that's what we learned from this. You, if you want to run a woke campaign, the public will be on your side, but you will destroy your country in the process. The difference between the UK and the U.S. is you respect each other, you appreciate each other, you want to learn from each other. We've lost that in America. We're so hateful and so mean and vicious. The left, the right, within the right. If you haven't come to that point yet, don't. Because in the end, you'll win an election and you'll lose a country. And your country's a beautiful country and a successful country. And you have nothing to apologize for. I cannot stand what's going on in academia in this country right now, but don't play into it, because you'll regret it in the end. Kate or, Kate or Gwen? Um, any uh, I mean, uh, the, the low tax thing is, um, well, it's, it's, we're not asking for low tax, are we? We're just asking for the government not to contribute 
on top of the highest tax burden in nearly 70 years. I think that's what I find most remarkable about it, is the idea that if we were to roll this back ever so slightly, we'd be living in some kind of low-tax, pro-growth utopia. We are so, so far away from that. The concern is that tax is now being used essentially as a political bribe, moving closer to elections, and one that the conservatives are now willing to show that they're going to break. As Frank points out, if you're labor, you're going to point out and say, what did you do and didn't you do when it came to your promises? And the fact that they have broken a manifesto promise on not raising national insurance and then going ahead and doing so anyway really suggests to me that we're out of money. And not in the ridiculous uh, government budget is a household credit card uh, analogy, it's not. But they are getting increasingly concerned that there aren't a lot of places they can guarantee a rise in revenue for the Treasury. That is why you're seeing this NI hike. Um, and as a few other panelists have pointed out, it's simply not the answer to our problems. We are going to end up spending like a mainland Europe country and we are not going to see the results of it because this is a government that is wedded to the idea of signaling that they are fixing the problems but either don't have an interest or haven't come up with the ideas for fundamentally changing public policy around some of the biggest issues and demographic changes that we're facing, especially when it comes to health care and pensions. Um, and it looks like they're going to, and, and I should add in net zero, because you know we've been told leading up to COP26, we're going to find out how we're going to pay for that. We're still waiting. Um, you know These are lofty ideas. In many ways, they're good ideas. Uh, but there is no ambition to figure out how we're going to do it properly. Um, so you know I, I think a lot of people aren't, aren't dreaming of a low tax utopia. They're just curious as to how conservatism is now defined by increasing such a severe tax burden, especially on people on the lower end of the income spectrum, and how on earth that's come to define conservatism. Well, first, I, 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 should, I should point out I mean, that you know, some of the most successful conservative leaders have defined conservatism, like Margaret Thatcher. Some of the most successful leaders, like Lord Salisbury, for example, have, have deliberately not defined conservatism, and everyone was actually kind of, kind of fine with it. Yeah, well, you don't necessarily need to define conservatism, but the conservatism is often about instincts, and instincts about being in tune with uh, people's lives and the way that they want to live them. And I think it is a natural conservative instinct to want to let people keep more of their own money and, as Michael said, recognise that they're more likely to make wise choices in how they spend it or invest it than somebody else will on their behalf. And one of the difficulties in this and the difficulty we face this year, of course, is that whilst conservatives don't like raising taxes, nor do conservatives like constantly borrowing more and more money uh, and leaving future generations to pay it back either. So, as Kate said, I think a certain uh, fiscal adjustment, uh, recognising the consequences of what's gone on over the last year and a half, uh, is understandable. The question, I, I guess, is uh, how do we turn that around and make sure there is a clear and plausible message uh, for the next general election? And if we want to go into the next general election, uh, with a credible reputation as a party that believes in the lowest taxes that can possibly be achieved in the circumstances, then we can't, quote Linton Crosby, you can't fatten a calf on, uh, or pig on market day. Um, you've got to start sooner than that. You've got to set out something well before that is uh, how we intend to achieve uh, that lower tax uh, future again and work to try to make people uh, believe it. And the final thing I just wanted to say, um, <laughs> Frank came to speak to uh, my colleagues in the House, and he did give us a thoroughly depressing uh, message about how all those things that we believe in and talk about so much about uh, enterprise and opportunity, uh, how they weren't resonating at all with almost anybody and that people just wanted uh, security and safety and they'd really like to um, know that nobody's going to trouble them much. Um, but. Uh, Frank, as you uh, concluded, uh, you did leave one other thing hanging in there, which didn't necessarily cheer us all up enormously, uh, but it was that the thing which most people volunteer as a major concern uh, was rising prices and a rising cost of living. And you know, that reads across to so many things, whether it's inflation, uh, whether it's actually the level of taxation and whether you're pushing people's living costs up through the taxes that they pay as well. So I think that's something we've got to be really critically aware of, and we've seen that so clearly in the last few weeks 
uh, with the uh, price of gas, how exposed people have felt if they were on a variable tariff and the cost of their heating, uh, looking like it would go up very rapidly. Suddenly, these things can change and become a very important concern. Um, Frank, do you want to come back on that? And then um, we should yeah. uh, take some questions. Um, so if the guys with the microphones can get into position and people can start thinking. Oh. We've lost yeah, no, I'm surprised. Working. There we go. Spoke for 24 straight hours at Oxford with Boris Johnson. He actually came to the debate. He was uh, a debating partner. So I should be able to do this without a microphone, but I'll, I'll use it. I want you to remember it this way. Personalized taxes. If you just talk about tax rates, it won't matter. If you talk about tax, the overall amount, it doesn't matter. When you wake up in the morning and you drink your first cup of coffee, you pay a sales tax. You go out to your garage, you pay an automobile tax. You fill up your car so you can drive to work, you pay a gas tax petrol tax. I've been here long enough to know the correct terminology. <laughs> At work, you pay an income tax. You turn on the light, you pay an electricity tax, write these all down. You're missing them. You flush the toilet, not that I'm thinking of you in toilets, but you flush the toilet. You pay a water tax. You flew here uh, from Dubai to get to Heathrow, you paid an airport tax. You stay overnight at the Premier Inn, which stinks, by the way, but it's all I can get. You pay a hotel tax. Get home, you pay a property tax, turn on your TV, you pay a, I cannot believe this, you pay a television <laughs> license. What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> Even when you die, you pay a death tax. By the way, there's much more. You have a sandwich, you pay a, uh, uh, what, what was it, at Miliband eating? What did they call it? Bacon sandwich? sandwich. Yes, you, you pay that tax too. DAT. You're taxed from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to sleep at night. You're taxed from your cradle to a grave. Hard-working taxpayers of the UK deserve a break, and we at CPS are going to give it to them. That's a personalized tax message. You, you, you present that. I used to be able to do that in one sentence. I used to be able to do that without a microphone. That is what you were trying to accomplish here, and I promise you, the public will, will back you if you personalize it that way. Very good. That's it. Frank, uh, the, 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 the last time I was, I was at a Tory fringe meeting where someone charged into the audience like that was when I was on a panel with Boris, John, <laughs> Boris Johnson and a lady fainted in the audience and he, he, ran out, he ran away from the stage and he picked up the lady in her chair and bore her out of the room uh, to, get, to get medical attention. And that so. woman later became his wife, so... Uh. <laughs> Um, so, guys, um, uh, can we um, uh, hands up for, for questions, and we'll um, ask maybe um, a, a couple at a time. Um, but one thing, just to, just to while, while the microphones get in place, is the um, it's actually it, weirdly we're talking about what conservatism is for. Well, we've had the answer basically that we're for fiscal discipline before we're for low taxes. If you see what I mean, like the, the, the you know the, the the Rishi Sunak argument would be that we you know that you you, you we, it could have all been lumped on the credit card, mm -hmm. but it was more important to constrained borrowing than, to, than not to raise taxes, which I think is an interesting distinction. Whether, it, whether the voters appreciate that, I, I don't know. But. It's a very legitimate one. I, I have a lot of sympathy for that, that um, the prime minister wants to spend money, and so you make it clear to him that if he's going to spend money, there's a tax hike that comes with it, um, because otherwise you do just rack up the debt and you put yourself in a very difficult position. Um, but I, I suppose the, the hole in the argument is that is there really nothing else you can do before you hike those taxes? No efficiency you can find, nothing else you can prioritize or cut back before you do it. Anyway, yeah, so yeah, the, the gentleman there and uh, uh, then and, and over there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, God bless you. Frank, incredibly passionate um, speeches. Um, my, my name is Councillor Alex here from Birmingham so a lot of the discussion has been around taxation. Do you not think that there's also an issue around an increasing skills gap around the community, leading to a declining uh, taxation revenue? And linked to that is around how individual personal responsibilities declining in the overall uh, society. As you see, there's a lot of uh, unemployment out there, but also there's a big uh, number of jobs available which people aren't availing themselves of, which is leading to a decline in tax income. 
So not necessarily around uh, us having a low taxation policy, but around a wider issue in society and where it's going in trends. Yes, and then the... Yeah, uh, we'll take a couple at a time. Sorry, okay. Um, so my question is probably directed at Frank, and it's regard to what, I, what my perception was with apparent contradiction in, in what you've been saying about woke. And in particular, it sounds like what you're saying is wokeness is kind of like an infection that if it spreads to your country, it will destroy it. If you fight it, it will destroy it. So what do we do about it <laughs> if we can't fight it? Do we just let it take over like a disease? Uh, two very good questions, um, Michael. I mean, do you want to start on? Uh, well, the, obviously, as a as a businessman, can, can you get can you get the workers, or, or you can all talk about woke if you if you prefer. Uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 Frank does that much more brilliantly than me. I, I think the skills issue is a very very legitimate one because ultimately, one of the big issues we've had in the UK over the past several years is productivity has been pretty static, um, and we need to work out a way of improving productivity. Improving productivity, by the way, although I'm very sympathetic to the problems of all the hauliers at the moment, the fact we've got shortage of hauliers, um, paying them more money does not actually make them more productive. But, um, but the, the issue of skills really comes down to education. And I think our education system has been um, a, 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 a lag influence on the UK economy for a very long time. At the very top end, some universities in the UK and a small number of schools are outstanding. But the, I think, sadly, if I'm honest, the, nation, the national educational system is poor, and of course, its, it's underperformance has been concealed by a shocking inflation of grades over multiple years. So, education is at the heart of this, in my opinion. So, so I, I should just add very quickly um, that you can also ask virtual questions because we are being streamed live to the nation uh, via the via the conference app. Um, although I'm, I, I'm not sure whether the cameras will have caught Frank's uh, dash. Into the uh, into the audience, but um, um, and sorry I, on, on the question about um, about well about about woke or if anyone if else wants, wants to raise skills. I did not realize that this is being recorded across. I thought it was just among us. So basically, I'm screwed. <laughs> 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 um, you're correct. Your your question is correct, and the answer is something that we should be doing a lot more of, and it stretches across the political boundaries. What are we for? Not what we are against. What do we believe in? Not what we oppose. That in this country and in my country, we always talked about the values that mattered most to us. In this country, your number one value is fairness. Actually, your number one value is truth, which is why it is absolutely essential that your leaders tell the truth about where things are, where they stand, because your population's tougher, I think, than ours are. And your population can understand and accept and appreciate when people are candid with them. But the way you respond to woke is not telling people I'm against the statues getting torn down, I'm against throwing people out of campus, it's what are you for? You're for academic freedom. You're for intellectual accountability. You're for a focus on the future rather than the past. We're not gonna relitigate the last 200 years, we're going to focus on the next 200 years. Tell people what you're for is the best response to woke. And one other thing, we have in America right now 11 million job openings. 11 million. It has never, ever been that high in American history. What the hell are we doing paying people to stay home? We are destroying the work ethic. We are destroying small businesses. We are making it impossible for restaurants to get back on their feet, for hotels to get back on their feet. And you're doing the same thing here. We are coming out of the pandemic. It's time to go back. It's time to do things better than they were. But with this great rethink that we are going through right now, what job we want to have, who we want to vote for, who our friends are, how we treat our family, with all of that, stop paying people to be at home. Get people back to work now. Um, to follow up on the job vacancies point in the UK as well, um, a million job vacancies, record high. 
um, wages are skyrocketing, um, especially for those who were experiencing stagnant wages for the past decade. Um, and this was the great trade-off. The 2010s were about high employment, but stagnant wages and low productivity. Um, and the combination of Brexit and COVID, but mostly COVID, um, has turned that on its head. Uh, and um, there are going to be some consequences to this, and, and shortages are one of them, and finding the balance is difficult. But a lot of employers who were not incentivized before to upskill their labor force, to actually give them the tools they need, um, are now in a position where they're going to have to in order to fill those job vacancies. So I think if you are in the UK now, coming off a furlough, potentially looking for new work or looking to change jobs, there's perhaps the silver lining is that there's never been a better time to increase your wages and to find an employer who's actually going to teach you that skill set. But, but, but this speaks to the conservative attitude to business, um, Graham and, and, and potentially Michael. Um, I mean, I, 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 I wrote in, in my Sunday Times column today, available in all good news agents, um, and internets indeed, um, the, I, I was struck by, I was writing about the, the supply shortages and the very punchy language from Kwasi Kwarteng, Boris Johnson, about how this is just a part of the post-Brexit adjustment from a low wage to a high wage economy. And that, you know, the, the, the quote I was given by, by someone was, you know, business has been drunk on cheap labor for too long. That's the, you know, that's the Conservative Party talking about, about business in quite a confrontational fashion. But increasing skills is the best way to increase the value of labour rather than simply seeing the uh, a shortage uh, effect uh, achieve that. Now, I was going to say, um, it struck me the first encounter that I ever had with the Centre for Policy Studies over 30 years ago. I was researching a pamphlet for an author, Peter Pilkington, who's a great man, and it was on exactly the subject of skills education. And uh, I discovered that there was a parliamentary report <coughs> into technical education in the 1880s, I think it was, um, which concluded uh, that we really needed to do what the Germans were doing, because we were really very bad at it. And uh, in the um, hundred and odd years uh, since then, uh, nothing had changed. And I think probably we'd still say that. And the um, way in which we have been uh, pushing so many people into higher education, particularly with rising cost of higher education, and the number of people who are not necessarily uh, getting the benefit from it um, that, that equates to what they're paying for it, I think is another uh, huge uh, concern here. We need to make sure people are learning the right things and getting the, the right uh, skills as well. And, and I just wanted to say at this point, the thing that worries me perhaps more than anything, and, and it's a kind of a tax, uh, is the interest rate that we levy on people's student loans, mm. uh, which I think is entirely unjustifiable and is a kind of opaque form of taxation where we charge above a market rate of interest in order to get more money in from some people who are paying more on their loans in order to su subsidise some other people. Um, but none of this is ever explained to the people who are participating in the system. Okay. Um, Alex and then um, the, the gentleman on the other side from him. So yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, no. So please go here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, this question is directed uh, towards Mr. Brady generally, if he doesn't mind. Um, the question I wanted to ask was about the whole. You talk about how high taxation is becoming a little bit of a conflict within some of the conservatives in itself. I think one thing is that um, many voters of the party who are loyal voters might be a bit more forgiving if you maybe focus a little bit more on socially conservative policies, like you were talking about grammar schools earlier. My question is, when are we going to see some more socially conservative policies come out of this government, which so far hasn't done very much beyond Brexit yet, it seems to me? And then, um, I, uh, I thought there was a very interesting point made about uh, making, <laughs> making people more efficient, uh, making the government be more efficient, and maybe one of the things we need to get better at is challenging free market cabinet ministers to say what are they doing in their department to be more efficient and better, because we have this supposed free market cabinet Boris Johnson may be a lost cause in terms of getting government down or even keeping it the same size, but if we can get free marketeers to cut their department spending, make those efficiencies, maybe that's the best way to get this particular government to be uh, able to keep taxes down, if not cut them. And the, uh, the gentleman on the yeah, opposite, yeah. So um, I, I work in health and social care, and on taxes, uh, our taxation policy has proven to be actually quite destructive. I know a lot of consultants who at the age of 55 will actually retire. There are lawyers who are de declining um, appointments to the judiciary because of the way we've raided pensions. Um, and we've also Brexited 
and yet we haven't really unwound a lot of the regulations, particularly around the working time directive. How can you train a decent consultant uh, with the working time directive in place? <laughs> the elements of that. So yeah. really, I think our taxation policy has really been quite destructive uh, in, in, in areas where we really want to show progress. So we have quick, some quite cheery um, issues there. Anyone want to, to lead off? Um, to Alex's point, um, perhaps one of the most embarrassing articles in retrospect, I thought I was so smart at the time, um, certainly not. The most embarrassing articles I've ever written in retrospect um, was an article for the Times Red Box in 2019, and it was entitled something like The Cabinet of Libertarian Comeback Kids. And I had good reason to think, looking at the makeup of the cabinet, that you had people who had not only been talking the free market talk, but had been writing pamphlets, they had been writing research reports for think tanks, they had been coming up with some brilliant market-oriented economic, economic freedom ideas. Um, and I think part of it, to criticize the prime minister, is that the way that COVID has changed that cabinet operates, it's more like holding court in many ways than it is actually empowering cabinet ministers. And I think what you get a lot of is, well, if only I could. Um, but again, if you are in this very high position of power and you're overseeing an entire department, uh, one that could be making some more liberal decisions, it, the responsibility really is on you. Um, and I think there should be more pressure on cabinet ministers to say exactly where they are enhancing these um, conservative ideas. Yes, I, th I think the spending review might uh, force some of these departments, these, these ministers, yeah. to rediscover the inner free market here if, if the Treasury gets its, gets its way. Um, a gentleman over here, I, I thought, I mean, you're absolutely right, the unintended consequences of tax rules or pension rule changes uh, can be uh, hugely important. And obviously, at the moment, when we've got this enormous backlog of cancer treatments and um, uh, scans and diagnosis that hasn't been undertaken, which I think is going to be one of the real uh, horror stories uh, that follows out of the, the last 18 months. Uh, we actually need more of these very skilled uh, people, the consultants, the surgeons, the people, as you say, many of whom walked away at 55. Some of them have left their professions altogether and retired. Uh, others uh, re retire and then come back on a higher daily rate uh, by doing uh, locum work. Uh, either way, it's not achieving what it's meant to achieve. And the gentleman here uh, on grammar schools, which I have been known to talk about from time to time, um, <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I would just say um, I wouldn't count that as social conservatism. Um, I think what the Butler Education Act did in 1944 was in many ways the most radical thing uh, that any government has done because what it was setting about was opening some of the best schools uh, to people uh, regardless of their parents' ability to pay for them to go there. And it had an enormous effect in opening up opportunity uh, through the 60s and 70s. Uh, and you saw more and more high court judges and permanent secretaries and all of the rest uh, coming from uh, less affluent backgrounds. And then we saw the true social conservatives uh, on the left snatching away those opportunities, getting rid of direct grant schools, uh, getting rid of grammar schools, and telling people they were just going to have to have uh, whatever it is they were offered. Uh, so we should have more grammar schools, but I wouldn't call it uh, social uh, conservatism uh, at all. And just finally on this, I think one of the interesting things, I wrote a, a article or chapter on this a, a few years ago and look back at the debates in Parliament on the Butler Education Act and it was fascinating. The, uh, the Act had cross-party support because it was clearly extending opportunity to people from working class and middle class families that they didn't have before. The Labour spokesman raised only one objection to the Act. It wasn't that grammar schools were being made free for people across the whole country. It was that it failed to extend free scholarships to the major public schools as well. And I think that was the Labour Party that was rather more in touch with uh, working people in this country uh, than the Labour Party of today uh, as well. In the response to the gentleman who asked about the government, the thing that the UK population wants, more efficient, more effective, and more accountable more efficient, they expect you to do more with less. More effective, they expect you to actually succeed. They do not accept failure. Stop talking about effort.
What the public really cares about is what you, in the end, what you deliver, and more accountable. So if you fail, you're held responsible. More efficient, more effective, more accountable. That's something that the public will vote for, but they're not convinced that that is necessarily a conservative principle. Michael, anything to, to come in on, on here? Uh, one other thing that really has barely been touched upon uh, today is that we haven't, for all the rhetoric in the Brexit vote for the freedoms that would uh, uh, come to us leaving the EU, I can barely think of any material uh, freedom that has come to economic freedom or, or regulatory freedom. I think there's been very little effort by the, the administration to focus on the regulatory issues and the many other issues that we uh, collected over many years of being part of the EU that can be reformed. It was mentioned briefly, I think very rightly, about the working time directive as one example, and I can think of very many others. So where is the Brexit benefit? We, we kind of would like to see it. Um, much talked about, nothing much done yet. The other thing, again, on on the economy, and we'd like to talk about skills, and by the way, I perfectly, I, I really um, enjoy listening to Frank's evaluation on how to message things more effectively, which I think often we're not good at. But the reality is, if we do not, we cannot uh, tax our way to growth. I know that's a bit of a cliche, but it is absolutely the truth. Um, so we have got to think again about what we're going to do to improve the efficiency of the economy to enable us to create an investment environment that makes the UK an attractive place to invest for foreign investors as well as domestic investors. Because without that, we're going to go into, a, 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 sadly, a, a long stagnation and decline, which will be a tragic reversal of that uh, extraordinary period post-1979 when Thatcher came into power. I entirely agree. I mean, one thing to, to flag on that is, in, in the same way as Graham's uh, grammar school point, um, I did some archaeology around the working time directive. And um, if you look back, when it was introduced, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, it was introduced by a rebellion of left-wing Labour Party MEPs. It, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown at the time were, were united in dis decrying this as a ruinous measure which would destroy the competitiveness of British industry. And now, of course, it is a, a sanctified human right that we could not possibly dream of touching um, to, to, to address this thing. So there, there, there is a certain sense in being conservative of, of fighting against the, the, the tide, I, th I, th I think. Um, and, but uh, yeah, um, I, the, re the regulation point is a, is a really good one. Um, we could probably have one, one more um, big round. Oh, that's quite a lot of... Um, People, um, yeah, just at the back there, and then in the front, and then, yeah, well, lots of people wanted to come in. And, we, and we've got a, we've got a, a, a question from the internet, which I think is quite interesting. Which is, um, is it time to sort of declare peace with Europe? Uh, like, do we, you know, now Brexit is done, you know, should we, should we, should we, should we be friends again, or, uh, or, or fight our corner? Um, I'll leave that to percolate while um, the, the microphones go. Hello. Thank you for your time today, guys. So my name is Tyrese Romain, YC from Erdington Constituency, currently running for council candidacy. Um, so my question is in relation to taxation. So I am a believer that low taxation and keeping as many as much of people's money in their own pockets is quite an important um, conservative policy. What kind of things do you think that the um, Conservative Party could have done differently um, instead of raising tax? There might have been more in keeping with that value or that policy. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a question on the individual liberty points. Um, we focused a lot on economics, but I want to just focus on the, the, the relationship between the individual and government. Obviously, in 2020, we had the pandemic, and the public seemed to support lockdowns and you know, various measures that maybe have dismayed many of us on the libertarian uh, side of the party. Um, what I wanted to kind of ask really direct to, to Graham um, is how much do you think that has been, is real of what the population really want, or is it a result of manipulated polling and you know, insidious behavioral advice within government from Stalinists like Susan Mikey? Um, and has that damaged the national psyche that people want that, and how do we reverse that? Or is it uh, a chimera that's, that's not really real, and actually we need to get, get those people out of the way and get beyond that to reignite the flame of liberty, feeding them through to, to Frank, Messaging-wise, how do we achieve that to get back to the kind of relationship we used to have with the state? I'll, I'll resist saying, Frank, as an expert on misguided polling. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just know, don't call someone a Stalinist. Uh, that's, that's my only advice on that one. Yeah. 
Um, Graham. In the, oh. Yeah, OK, on, 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 on all of those. Um, uh, is it time to declare peace with Europe? Yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the great purposes of us leaving the European Union should have been to end this perpetually uh, difficult relationship uh, where we were in the club and always wanting to hold it back, whereas others that were members of the EU, not all of them, but some of the original members in particular, uh, wanted to see much deeper integration than the United Kingdom could ever contemplate. Uh, so us leaving should be a benefit for those that want to integrate more, misguidedly in my view, and I think there'll be consequences in the long term uh, from that, uh, but also a benefit for us uh, that we can get on with making our own decisions, being our own independent democracy, and uh, being friends uh, with our neighbours. And I think we probably should put a, a little bit more effort into that than we have for a long time as well. And as a, a brief aside on that, a uh, little anecdote that I always tell people from the time when I was Shadow Europe Minister and we were trying to form our new group outside the PPE, uh, uh, or whatever it was called, the EPP, um, in uh, the European Parliament, uh, was a time we'd found a, a part, an Estonian party which was as like the British Conservatives as any you would find anywhere in the world. And I went to speak at their party conference, uh, in English of course, not in Estonian, and um, at the night before the conference, at the conference reception, I met a chap from the German, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, that I got to know quite well. And I said to him, I didn't realize you were going to be here. And he said, my dear Graham, he said, of course I'm here. We are paying for the conference. And at that moment, I realized there was no earthly way they were going to join our new group in the European Parliament. Uh, the Germans were much better at being friendly uh, to their neighbors than, than we were. Um, uh, what could you di do differently, read tax? Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, I guess my answer is that I would not have wanted to see as much activity restricted uh, for as long as it was. And right from the simplest uh, thing that could have been done, which I was saying in April 2020, a very uh, small but simple and obvious illustration, uh, and I read an article saying, why can I go to Tesco's and buy a bunch of flowers, but the chap at Altrincham Market who sells flowers outdoors has been banned by law from selling them. Now, that's tiny, uh, but if you multiply that across all those activities that we knew from the start could have been reopened safely, then we wouldn't have been dealing with the same degree of hit to the British economy that we have been. And, and finally, uh, to uh, individual uh, liberty, um, I think people were frightened, and it was done uh, partly by a hugely effective uh, messaging campaign. I think Isaac Levido, uh, who uh, used messaging very effectively for the Conservative Party in the last election, um, came up with the uh, stay home, save the NHS, uh, save lives, etc. Um, and it, it really worked. It really got through. And a lot of people, I think, were genuinely frightened at the beginning, and that was maintained uh, for a long time. I'm reassured that I think people have moved on. And I think people have started to measure risk more for themselves and are starting to take a more um, balanced view of these things. Uh, but I think it's something we've really got to fight for and make sure that people don't believe that there can be a fundamental uh, shift in the relationship between the citizen and the state. Uh, we've got to make sure we reassert our right to make our own decisions for ourselves. Um, if we go to, to Michael, and also if, if we could sort of fold in any, uh, any closing remarks, I was going to ask you all, like, what, what do you think Boris should, Johnson should do in the next, like, if you were in the number 10, what would be the, the first few things you would do to, be, to, to put conservatism back on the, on the right track? So if, I, think, uh, I think I'd like to hear some rhetoric from, from the Prime Minister about what he is going to do to uh, a vision, if I dare say it, a uh, rare thing perhaps in politics, a vision of how he's going to take us back to a, a, a lower tax, more streamlined economy. Um, well, to be honest, I'd do a bit of signaling myself just to reassure everybody that I was indeed a conservative and we could scrap HS2 and do a few other things that would just make it very clear that the party actually understood that um, bad policies cost a lot of money. Um, and I suppose on that liberty point, I think one of the one of the biggest disappointments about coming out of COVID is that we never had that big freedom day. 
Freedom Day was delayed, and then when it came, the rhetoric of the Prime Minister was essentially, we're bringing in vaccine passports, it's still not all that safe, you still must be very cautious. And I think because we've never had this sort of big bang moment, a lot of the liberties that we hold very sacred are still somewhat in jeopardy. There's still questions about the winter, this idea that they could bring back restrictions despite the vaccine so obviously working. Um, and I think that the, the future of conservatism for people who still really abide by it is going to be to fight for those liberties because, um, you know, let's not go into the COVID debate. There are lots of good reasons that they were restricted, but we now need to fight for all of them to come back and, and there's, they still haven't. And uh, Frank, any thoughts on any of the below or, or, or your, your, your recommendations to Boris Johnson? Just, uh, he's magic in the North. I've never seen a politician like him. So we will sit here and we'll criticize some of his policies and the, some of the policies of the party. But this guy is getting votes, is getting people to listen who never voted conservative before. Four words for you to remember. Labor leavers left labor, <laughs> but they haven't joined the conservatives. They voted against labor in 2019. They haven't aligned themselves with you all yet. And it is not just about, I'm, I'm intimidated. I mean, you're, I'm a performer. This is the intellect down here, and I really don't belong here. And he's a performer too, and he's a great one. And he's gonna give you all an opportunity. You all need to drive the policy for him, and he'll be the vessel the vehicle to deliver it because in the Western world, I don't know anyone who has a greater ability to get people who would otherwise dislike those on the right to give you a hearing. He gives you a voice and hopefully he'll give you a vote as well. But um, don't, don't forget that people like him come along once a generation and if, uh, if he's undermined it'll undermine all of you as well. Thank, thanks, Frank. Um, so now I have a, a, a tiny laundry list of, of things to remind you about, which is that we have an incredibly good program of um, events here over the next few days. Um, please, there should be uh, an example in your seat. Please grab one. Please grab copies of our reports. Please grab um, bags at the back. Please follow CPS on Twitter and uh, Facebook and Instagram and all the rest of it. Please take a f selfie with Margaret Thatcher, who has made it through security in, yeah. in cardboard cutout form. Our glorious co-founder um, will be uh, hopefully uh, the viral hit of conference. But thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to our speakers, Lord Spencer, Graham, Sir Graham Brady, Kate Andrews, and Frank Lutz.